Amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor. Well, good morning, Rooted Fellowship. It is good to be back with you guys again today. Uh, I actually looked, I looked at what I preached on five years ago for your fourth anniversary service, and it was Philippians 3. And because I'm, a, I'm an expository preacher, we're just going to do the next chapter. So Philippians 4 <laughs> is where we are. I know it's been five years, but this is the way we have to do it, okay? So, uh, and what I want to do is I want to look at a passage in Philippians 4 and just stare at it together a little while. And in this passage are four little words loaded with nuclear power for your life, should you believe them. Four little words that are the antidote to all fear. Four little words that will invincibilize you for the worst trials you will ever face. Four little words that strike fear into the devil's heart. Four little words that is the hope of the church throughout all ages until Jesus Christ returns. Four little words that will change your life if you should wake up into each and every day of that life and press these words and the reality behind these words into your heart. You know what those four words are? The Lord is near. The Lord is near. The Lord is near. And so the Apostle Paul writes in Philippians 4, verses 4 through 7 Rejoice in the Lord always, rooted fellowship. I will say it again rejoice. Let your graciousness be known to everyone. The Lord is near. So don't worry about anything. But in everything through prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. This is the word of the Lord. Charles Spurgeon, one of my favorite preachers uh, from the 19th century uh, church in London that he pastored. Charles Spurgeon tells the story of uh, an atheist who wrote on a piece of paper the words, God is nowhere. And then asked uh, his child to read that out to him. God is nowhere. But the child read it different, and the child read it, God is now here. And it was the truth instead of a lie, and actually over time stuck in that man's heart, and the Spirit of God drew him to the saving work of the Son. God is now here. The Lord is near. And the God of the Bible is not the God of deism, who stands far away and disconnected and aloof from what is going on in your life each and every day of that life. He didn't just make the world, get it going, and then tap out to see what happens. The God of the Bible is the God who is near. And He's near at, at multiple levels, right? I mean, God is near in the fact that God is omnipresent or everywhere present. That means God inhabits not only everywhere, but also every when of all of time and space. So anywhere that you can point to and go there, God is. Then God is. But he's even nearer than that. He's near in that he sent his only son, Jesus, into the world. The incarnation of Jesus into the world. What greater fulfillment of God's promise that I am with you, of the Lord is near, is there than the Emmanuel, God with us, Jesus Christ, who left his throne and came and was born in a barn and exchanged the glory of his crown for a bloody Roman cross because he drew near. And yet he's even nearer than that. Because the omnipresent everywhere God who drew near as the Emmanuel, God with us, also dwells in us through the Holy Spirit. 
And so not only is God around us and God with us, for the believer, we have God within us. The Lord is near. The Lord is near. The Lord is near. And I don't know if you picked up from it in the passage there, there's a couple of commands that, that by themselves kind of sound impossible. Like apart from the nearness, the empowering nearness of God, the commands that Paul gives in this passage that we just read seem unattainable. Right, there's three of them in particular that I want you to consider. Rejoice always. Okay, Paul. I don't know if you know that life's hard. Rejoice always. Be unworried about anything. Really, Paul? There's a lot of reasons to be worried in our lives. Pray in everything. Rejoice always, be unworried about anything, praying in everything, apart from the nearness of Jesus, these are impossible commands. But in Jesus, listen, if you are in Christ Jesus, these practices are more than just a possibility. They are your inheritance of rejoicing always, unworried about anything. Praying in everything because of the access you have to God through the blood of our Lord Jesus. Four little words that bring several seemingly impossible commands into the realm of possibility and, and, and rooted fe fellowship. This is what real Christianity looks like. So I want to look at those three commands along with that phrase, the Lord is near. Three commands. And the first one, on your birthday, this one should not be too hard, is rejoicing always. Rejoicing always. Paul says in verse four, rejoice in the Lord always. And I will say it again, rejoice. Now throughout the book of Philippians, if you remember, this is the epistle of joy. And Paul mentions joy or rejoicing 16 times in these four short chapters. I mean, it's just, he's overflowing with rejoicing and joy in God. Why does Paul keep saying that? Well, because we need to keep hearing it, right? We need to be reminded again and again of the joy that is ours in Jesus. And listen, if you're walking through something right now where you're like, it's nice, Paul. I'm so glad that you're, you've got the circumstances of your, of your life all easy and peachy and comfortable so that you can rejoice always. I don't know if you can really understand what I'm going through when I go home from church today, but it's not exactly a rejoicing situation, Paul. And maybe you might feel that way. It's helpful for all of us to remember the, the location from which Paul is writing this epistle of joy. He's writing from prison where he's been unjustly imprisoned for the sake of the gospel of the Jesus that he loves and knows and preaches. And Paul is rejoicing from a jail cell. So he gets what you're going through. And in, an, in, an, in some miraculous way, this is why I believe joy here is not suggested, but commanded. Wow. Joy does not belong to the emotional category of your life. Joy is far more than an emotion. Joy is a reality that is yours in Jesus so that now you can have joy. Joy sits under all the emotions, the whole spectrum of bliss, happiness, all the way to grief and lament. And joy can sit even under the sad and darker parts of our emotional life because our joy isn't, going, isn't, isn't about what's going on around us, but in who Jesus is for us. And that's why he says, rejoice in the Lord. Not your circumstances, they're always changing. In the Lord, he's never changing. I mentioned earlier that I just came from the Lasan Congress in South Korea. And on one of the days there, we heard from leaders within the persecuted church from around the world. And one of them was an Iranian uh, leader of, of the church in Iran. And Iran, guys, has had just this astronomical move of the spirit over the last 30 years or so. In 1995, there were 500 Christians in Iran. There are now over a million believers 
in Iran. And Iran, the Iranian church is the fastest growing church on earth right now, real, like real time. And so this man, his name was Fashid Fati. Fashid Fati. There's a picture, I believe, of, of him on the screen behind me. He's presently um, ministering in all sorts of different places there. And, uh, and Fashid was talking about how the last time he, he came to a Lausanne Congress was the one in Cape Town in 2010. And he came there and he was the only believer from inside of Iran who came to that particular Congress. And he said that uh, he, he was out of the country for 65 days. And then when he got home, the authorities there, the government in Iran, arrested him and put him in jail for the next five years for his Christianity. I snapped this photo on my iPhone of, of what, this is the moment he's telling this story. He's like, so the last time I went to Lausanne conference, I went home and they put me in jail for five years. And then he bursts out laughing and says, hopefully that doesn't happen this time. <laughs> And it was just wild to see this guy's joy in light of his suffering. He said, at one point, they put me in solitary confinement for a full year. I did not see the sun in the sky for a year of my life. And then he said, but the Lord was my light and my salvation. Of whom shall I be afraid? The Lord is near. How do we rejoice always? We rejoice always by remembering that our joy is in the Lord who is always with us. So in one sense, let me, let me borrow an illustration from my friend and mentor, Ray Ortland, since he's not here with you guys this morning. This is one of my favorite things that Ray has helped me see. Ray has helped me see that the Christian life is always being lived at two levels. Always. You are living in the level of your circumstances, always changing. And then you are also living in Christ Jesus, who is never changing. That's good. That's good. So right now you are in a building and that's going to change throughout the course of today. You are going to go into different buildings. And throughout this week, you're going to go maybe into different towns and suburbs and even cities perhaps, and your geographical location is going to change. But what's not going to change is you are at a deeper level in the solar system. So no matter, no matter where you go in this world, no matter how many planes you catch, you're not leaving the solar system. I don't care if you're Elon Musk, you're not leaving, right? And so you are living in two levels in the ever-changing geography of the different buildings you go in, but you are in the solar system. And beyond that, you are living in the changing circumstances of your life, but you are in Christ Jesus. If you have shifted from a trust in yourself to a trust in Jesus. The Bible describes another level of God's nearness, more than just his, his omnipresence, more than just Emmanuel, the incarnation, more than even the Holy Spirit inside of you. Now you are described bibli biblically as in Christ. The New Testament refers to us three times as Christians. It refers to us 216 times as in Christ. Wow. How do you think the writers of the New Testament want us to understand our relational proximity to the Lord in light of our activity in this life and our identity before Him? In Christ Jesus. And family, what can steal your joy? If your joy is grounded in the life, death, resurrection of Jesus Christ, what can steal your joy? So many things will try, changing circumstances, but ultimately changing circumstances cannot steal your joy because unlike the rest of the world, your ultimate hope is not in what's happening around you, but in who Jesus is for you. Trials and challenges cannot ultimately steal your joy 
For in the hands of Jesus, your trials become your personal servants who are preparing you and preparing for you an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. So trials can't steal your joy. Betrayal cannot ultimately steal your joy. For even though every person in the world might desert you, Jesus said, I will never leave you or forsake you. Satan cannot ultimately steal your joy for Jesus has triumphed over him and put him to shame. The best that Satan can now do is to lie to you, to seek to deceive you, to try to convince you to go looking for your joy anywhere else other than Jesus, but he cannot ultimately take your joy in Jesus away from you because he can't take Jesus away from you. All he can do is deceive. Sin cannot ultimately steal your joy. For in Christ's atoning death, you have received not only the gift of forgiveness for your sins, but the gift even of spirit-powered repentance of your sins, which is itself a grace of God. And even death cannot ultimately steal your joy. For Jesus has defeated death through his bodily resurrection. And to die is to be with the one in whose presence there is fullness of joy. Real Christianity means we let the the fact of our location in Christ Jesus, be it on a beautiful moment or in a prison cell like Paul, the fact of our location in Christ, we let that give shape to the constantly changing circumstances that we face and not the other way around. Our circumstances will change. Life will be beautiful, life will be painful. But Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And if you belong to him, if your heart has opened up to his love, you are in Christ Jesus. And those who have been forgiven of sin and those who have received the spirit of God to live in them and indwell them and those who know their names are written in the Lamb's book of life and those who know that they have something in this world that nothing can give them and that nothing in the world can take away from them always have a reason to rejoice. The fact of our identity, the good news of the gospel, it is finished. Right? Those were the dying words of Jesus. It is done. The dying words of Buddha were strive without ceasing. The dying words of Jesus were it is finished. That's why no one wrote a song called Amazing Karma. Amazing Grace. How sweet the sound. Because Amazing Karma, that song would have sucked. Okay? We have the best news in the world. Amen? Amen. We always have a reason to rejoice. Rejoice in the Lord rooted. I will say it again. Rejoice. Verse five. Let your graciousness be known to everyone. The Lord is near. And then he says, be worried about nothing. He goes on and says, don't worry about anything. So let me just do this in in two parts here. Firstly, Philippians chapter four, verse five confronts us with an important question. And it's the question of what do we as believers want to be most known for? And we might answer that question in a lot of different ways. We might might be tempted to say, well, for my career or for my achievements or for my connections or for my affluence or for my, my kindness or for my children or for my physical appearance or whatever it is, we might fill in that gap with wanting to be known for. And the Apostle Paul says that what we ought to desire to be known for is our graciousness, our reasonableness, our gentleness, the different ways that that word is translated. He says, let your graciousness be known to everyone. And here's why we can. 
in an angry world where people love to divide over something new every single day, in the constantly divisive cultural moment we find ourselves in, in various parts of the world in different ways, but all in the 21st century, there is, ang- there is an angry world. In the middle of that, Christians believe the Lord is near. And if the Lord is near, that changes the way I treat you. If the Lord is near, I can't demonize you because the Lord is near and I'm learning to see you through his eyes. You are made in the image of God. You bear the Imago Dei. There is inherent dignity, value, and worth in you. I'm not better than you at all. And now, because the Lord is near, we are humbled into graciousness. The Lord is near. Let your graciousness be known to everyone. And then he says, so this is kind of like part B, don't worry about anything. So the Lord is near is what empowers our graciousness to everyone. And the Lord is near is what empowers our unworriedness about anything. That's the hinge that the whole of the Christian life swings on. The Lord is near. It empowers our love for one another. It empowers our fearlessness when we go through hard times in life. And we will go through hard times in life. And friends, everything changes when you know that the Lord who is strong, that the Lord who is mighty, that the Lord who is sovereign, that the Lord who loves you is the Lord who is with you. That's why we're reminded over and over throughout the Bible, Old Testament and New, I am with you, declares the Lord. Over and over. Everything changes when you're in the presence of one who you know is stronger than you and who loves you. The Lord is near, so don't be worried about anything. A number of years ago, I was driving home from, uh, from work, and as I came around the corner uh, to go up this hill where our, our house was on, uh, it was our old house, and I came around this corner, and there was this huge, long, it looked like this very long, like new speed bump that they'd put into the road. Like it was like that, oh, that's new. And I'm driving around this corner, and, uh, and suddenly the speed bump started to like move. And it was the biggest snake I've ever seen in my life. Like it was, it spanned the whole road. It was, it was so big and just like thick, right? And so I'm like, oh my goodness. So I sort of drive around this gigantic, gigantic snake and, and drive up to my house, which is like, like 100 meters up the road from where the snake was. And I park the car and I run inside and I did what any Australian's going to do, which is like, all right, Christina kids, let's go look at the crazy big snake. <laughs> So, this is, so we, we, we go down the hill and you know, the sun's starting to set a little bit and we go down the hill and we're looking at this snake and just you know, getting, getting kind of close, but not too close and, and we're taking some photos of it and then you know, we have the moment and some of you right now are like, Australians are crazy. <laughs> what is wrong with you people? It's true. It is true. And, and, and so the sun starts to go down. So now it's getting dark. It's like, oh, okay, this is probably not safe. It probably wasn't safe at all. But now it's less safe because now we can't see the gigantic mega snake. And, um, and so we start, we turn around and start walking up, up the hill. And uh, my eldest daughter, Alea, uh, she was maybe about 9, 10, 11 at the time. She's 16 now. And she says to me, she's like, Dad, I bet I could beat you in a race. And I said, girl, there is no chance you can beat me in a race. Come on. And so she starts like trash talking me a little bit. And I'm talking back to her. And she's like, all right, let's do this. I'm like, all right, I'll give you a head start. Let's go. And so she runs, starts taking off as fast as she can, you know, 100, 150 meters up the road to our, to our house. And then the, the boys, my, my sons, I've got three sons and another daughter, the boys, they all start running. I give them all a head start. And then I start running. And I, like, this mattered to me, guys. I needed to win, okay? And there's nothing quite as pathetic as, like, a middle-aged white guy running past a group of children um, in a running race. But there I was, you know, pumping my arms, determined to win. And I crossed that line, uh, like Usain Bolt, coming through the finish line of my driveway. And, and, you know, looked at my daughter like, yeah, yeah, you don't have it yet. And then all of a sudden, I hear this scream. 
like the kind of scream that, that gives you instant goosebumps. And I turn around, and it's the scream of our youngest daughter, Eliana. And she is running up the hill and her face is just drained of all color. Her her eyes are like saucers. She is petrified. And she's running and and I run down to her and I sort of grab her in my arms and she's just weeping these tears. and, And here's what happened. Eliana didn't realize there was a race. And she looks up and sees her older sister running as fast as she can. And then sees her older brothers running as fast as they can. And then sees her slightly overweight dad running as fast as he can. And in her mind, she's like, the snake is coming. And she's in last place. And so she runs into my arms and I just sweep her up and I hold her close. I'm like, no, baby, no. Like, hey, if there was danger with the snake, daddy is not running from the snake, okay? And leaving you as snake bait. Daddy is running to the snake and standing between you and the snake. And, and I get to console her and tell her, no, no, I would never, ever do that. And I've got tears in my eyes at what she must have been feeling in that moment. And as I reassured her with my presence, her tears subsided, her fears subsided, and they were replaced with peace in the presence of one who is stronger than her and who loves her. That's what it's like to live in light of the reality The Lord is near. So don't worry about anything. Live unworried, whatever comes your way. The most repeated command in the scriptures is the command, fear not, or do not be afraid, or do not be worried. And so frequently that command is paired with the promise, fear not, for I am with you. Do not be afraid, for I am with you. The Lord is near. Don't worry about anything. What problem in your life is not answered by a lived awareness of the risen Jesus in that moment with you right now? Knowing that the Lord is near answers our loneliest moments in life as we remember that we have a friend who will never abandon us. Knowing that the Lord is near answers our doubts in the hardest moments and seasons of our life as we learn to say with David who wrote the famous Psalm in Psalm 23, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? For you are with me. The Lord is near. So how might your life look today? This week? If you were to leave this place and walk back into all of your present difficulties and challenges, and yet you did so convinced, knowing that moment by moment, God himself, The Lord was with you, sustaining you, walking beside you, interceding for you, never abandoning you, always near to you. You would live rejoicing always. You would live unworried about what you're facing. And if he was with you and walking with you and you and I were convinced of that, we would live prayerful in everything. Which is my third and last point. Praying in everything because the Lord is near. Paul writes, the Lord is near, so don't worry about anything, but in everything through prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. 
praying and everything. We're still dealing here a little bit with that worry and that anxiety that we talked about in that that second point there. And anxiety and worry is basically just when we look at the future and just anticipate things going bad. And there's, there's a spectrum of that, and obviously there's very acute clinical types of anxiety that, that there are gifted uh, counselors and psychologists in the body of Christ that can help us untangle our minds. Praise God for them. Amen. But what Paul is talking about here is, I believe, the general anxiety that is true of all of humanity that just comes from life lived in the world. And the fact that Scripture admonishes us with don't be anxious again and again assumes that we will be. Paul knows we're going to be anxious. Paul himself even writes, uh, it was in in, uh, 2 Corinthians um, chapter 11, I believe it is. He says, you know, all the things, I, I carry all these things on me, along with that, the anxiety for all of the churches. And he uses that same word. So even the most faithful and focused and Christ-like believers will encounter periods of worry and anxiety or spiritual darkness from time to time in their lives. And Paul here is giving us a tool. And he's saying that the way that we move from anxiety to trust, from worry to peace, is through the tool of prayer. Notice the contrast. Don't worry about anything, but in everything through prayer, present your requests to God. As I've thought about it over the years, I've realized that my worry is really just misdirected prayers. What is worry but me praying to me. How am I going to fix this? How am I going to solve this? How am I going to be the savior in this moment? Now, here's the good news. If you know how to worry, you know how to pray. You just need to send your worries Godward instead of selfward. And that's why Paul contrasts them. Don't worry about anything, but in everything through prayer. Peter says something really similar in 1 Peter 5 verse 6. He says, humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God. And what is humbling ourselves but the posture of prayer? Of saying, God is God and I am not. Humble yourselves before God so that at the proper time, he may exalt you, casting all of your, what's the word? Anxieties. He says, cast them onto him. That's prayer. It's bringing our worries to God. It's casting our anxieties upon him. Why? Because he cares for you. I love this so much. So listen, listen. Here's what Peter's saying. Here's what Paul is saying. In God's hands, right? In God's hands, even our anxieties work for the good of those who love him by revealing to us the burdens that he wants us to bring to him in prayer. And even your worries now become fuel for your prayer life. That's how you pray without ceasing because we all know we're going to worry without ceasing. We all know there's an uncertainty about what we're going to do and how we're going to go there and do this and fix that and go here and whatever it is. And and, and and, and Peter is saying, and Paul is saying, cast those onto him. Bring them to him in prayer. That's the ammunition that we have. Here's another way I like to think about it. Think about it like this. Every arrow of anxiety that Satan just wants to line up and shoot at your heart. What Paul's talking about here is learning to see those arrows, even the satanic ones, as kindling for the bonfire of your prayer life. And so he lines me up and says, how am I going to fix that? Oh man, that one stung a little bit. I'm going to, okay, I need to take that out. Thank you, Satan. 
for revealing to me an area I need to bring to God. You have served my sanctification so well. <laughs> and I bring it to God. <laughs> Here's another one. Oh, what am I going to do there? Jesus, I don't know, but I know you know. So Lord, I'm bringing that to you. And now I'm using all these anxieties, all these arrows that come and prick my life in the bonfire of prayer. Pray without ceasing. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. And Paul here is drawing on that imagery of the prison cell from where he is writing this very letter. There's a garrison of Roman soldiers who are nearby to him. And and he is essentially saying, exchange your worry for prayer. And here's the impact of that. And God's peace will stand like a garrison of soldiers watching over you in the same way that I'm in jail right now and I got a garrison of soldiers watching over me, except for the believer, that's gonna be God's peace watching over you. That is the impact of exchanging our worries for prayer. So let me close and land with this as, as the band come on up. There are a lot of reasons why you might worry about the future. In fact, why don't you even just think about that thing right now for you? Whatever that thing is, that reality that causes you some uncertainty, maybe you just feel unsettled. It's like, I just don't know what I'm going to do with this. I don't know the way forward through, through that. Maybe it's something in, in, in your parenting right now with your kids or teenagers. Maybe it's something in your marriage. Maybe it's something that you're trusting God for with your life and direction and, and your vocation. And Lord, what do you want me to do? And you're just not sure. There's worry. There's anxiety. You're unsettled. Or maybe it's deeper than that. Maybe it's, it's really got a grip of your heart. Maybe it's like paralyzing your joy. It hasn't taken it away, but it's got a vice grip on it because that's all you can see right now is that worry, that thing about tomorrow, that thing about the future that you just don't know what to do with. Now, here's the problem. As you think about whatever that thing is or a range of things it could be for some of us, Here's the problem with letting our minds run wild with a thousand hypothetical scenarios of what tomorrow might bring our way. The problem is, is we are usually not factoring in what we will have in that tomorrow. Or to state it better, who we will have in that tomorrow. And we're being reminded here, the Lord is near. He was near then, He is near now. He will never let you go. And isn't the problem with so much of our anxiety about the future that we create a scenario in our mind that is absent of God. When we start overthinking it and going through all the, how am I gonna, how am I gonna, how am I gonna, we're forgetting the God who is near in the middle of all of those uncertainty. We are imagining a hypothetical impossibility because we are imagining a future where God has ceased to be God where God has ceased to be good, where God has ceased to be near. And this is the God who says, I will never leave you or forsake you. I am with you. Nothing in all of creation can separate you from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, your Lord. The Lord is near. So rooted fellowship on your anniversary as you walk into now the 10th year of your life as a church. The God who is near to you on this day is the God who will be near to you every day of that future ahead of you, come what may. So in light of that, rejoice in the Lord. Be unworried about anything. 
in everything by prayer. Bring your requests to God. Future you will indeed face troubles that will make you anxious, but future you will indeed be upheld by the faithfulness of God. So would you stand with me this morning as we finish and respond and look away from self to Christ. And maybe today you're doing that for the very first time. We're so glad you are and your heart has cracked open to Jesus. And you've, you've, you've moved from seeing God as a threat to your joy to seeing God, to seeing the Lord Jesus as the source of your joy. And listen, if that's you, we'd love for you to pray with someone after the service. And Pastor Ane said there's different areas of prayer and there's people around who would love to pray with you. For the rest of us, as we look away from self to Jesus too, because the gospel isn't just for unbelievers, it's for everyone, amen? We need that good news every day of our lives, amen? So here's what I'd love for you to do. If there's something right now that as we were landing that sermon there that the Spirit was bringing to mind for you, for future you, for tomorrow you, to trust into God's hands. Here's what I want you to do. I want you just to close your eyes and open up your hands in that posture of surrender and receiving. I want to pray a blessing over you as we respond now and sing. Heavenly Father, I ask that you would meet with us now. You've been meeting with us all the way through this day already. You are near. And Lord, for everyone here who's opened their hands, holding in it something about the future that has unsettled them, as they exchange worry for prayer, oh God, would you fill them with your peace. And with those four wonderful little nuclear words, just press them into their hearts. Holy Spirit, we pray, the Lord is near. The Lord is near. The Lord is near. The Lord is near. And we are in the presence of the one who is infinitely stronger, who is mighty to save and who loves us. God, I pray that you would meet these men and women and fill them with not only your peace, Lord, but your joy, your courage, your wisdom, your life as they look away from themselves to Jesus, the Emmanuel who is near. And we ask this in his beautiful name. Amen. Amen.